Hey everyone, it's Joseph Shepard. And I'm Marta Mama. <laughs> Welcome to Exposed España. It's a podcast where we break down all things Drag Race España season three. Before we get into it, Marta, how was your week? Your computer broke? Yeah, my computer just broke. Oh my God, in the worst moment possible, just after the Snatch game with all of the reference and all the things I have to explain. Like it's the one episode that I need my computer, but well, it's fine. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Did you, did you like the episode? I did like the episode. I feel like there was a lot more heart this episode. Right? It was like, like the first two episodes of the season, they were dropping the ball a little bit, but now it feels Drag Race España again, right? Yes. And that's what I was like so excited for. I was like, oh my gosh, now we're back in the kick. I was like, I don't know what I'll watch those first two episodes, but these next two, they're they're hitting it. Yeah, they're hitting it. We've got some drama this episode. Yes. Finally. We got a lot. (laughs) We got a lot coming through. Let's go ahead and get into this then. The captions for this lovely reading challenge were the worst captions I think that I've read in my life. I don't I I understood maybe 10% of the jokes. I did understand that Paquita was the winner. 100%. There was nobody else. I got it and I got her jokes. But mm-hmm. were there actually like any other standouts or was everybody just kind of like okay? I don't know what's going on with the subtitles. I haven't watched it with the subtitles. I need my computer for that. <laughs> so, I really don't know what what was confusing because for example, Bestia did a very good job. No, it was so bad to read. Like literally every single joke was butchered. It would, I don't think I really understood anything at all. Rafita told, uh, not Benedita, Ornella, that her eyes are very close together, which was hilarious. (laughs) Yes, yes. I remember that now, yes. (laughs) But like, uh, I don't know. It was cute. It was very funny in Spanish, like, it's not usually that funny. I love that Lisa was answering all of them. You uh-huh. know, every time someone was reading Lisa, she was, it was going back to you. Absolutely. And they did this cute thing. Did you get that? That Pincha didn't do the reading challenge, Pinchadora, because she took a moment just to like give appreciation to Bania Vainilla. She was having a hard day. Mm-hmm. So she started the read, but instead of finishing with a terrible read she just said very nice things about Vanya and she says that's not the day to be reading people that are not feeling well and so she just didn't do the challenge what do you think about that like should we should should they do that or should they just go on or I think when somebody's mental health is in the way and if you're a friend of that person I I think that she did the right thing I mean at the end of the day it's like you know you 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 don't want to see your friend in that state. And that's not a good state. And you could tell that there was a lot going on with Vanya. Yeah. Yeah, she was having the hardest, hardest, hardest time. But it's nice that, you you know, like, we, Spain is a kind of a large country to be Europe, but maybe you can compare it with, like, Texas. We have okay. way, more pop, way more population than Texas, but it's smaller than Texas, probably. So it's like, we all kind of know each other. Like, Banya was explaining to Supreme. Do you remember that time in Paris? Yes, in Paris when we got stuck, we in, the stuck in the elevator. Like they've all lived things together. And you have to remember that also they're all living in the same house. They're not in mm-hmm. hotel rooms. They spend a lot of time together talking when the cameras aren't rolling. So there's a lot of things that we are not seeing. So, you know, friendships are forming and they all care about each other. And I think that's super cute. But do we know what Vanya was feeling trapped about? I think she was having some problems with her insecurities, the mm. imposter syndrome. How, you know, RuPaul loves to say the inner saboteur. Mm-hmm. You know, she's been working for all her life, but she's never had to do these type of things. She's been working for over 20 years. And now she sees wow. a lot of like younger queens doing amazing and you know, it's hard sometimes. All of that yeah. is super hard. Especially when you, when you, like you said, like you have been doing this for such a long time, you feel like you are on top of the world. And then if you're not getting recognized the way that the younger queens are, I could see that. Yeah, but I think that sometimes in other franchises, like in the US, these things 
seem like a lot more produced mm -hmm. like here you can see that it was more natural and it wasn't like she's not trying to create a story there she's just trying to fight whatever she's she has going on yeah it wasn't know. like waited till that right little minute where everybody's doing their makeup and then she turns to one person and says i feel like i'm stuck yeah absolutely she was just real i don't know i love Annie. i love all the girls I do too. Yeah. And I've been feeling too, like it's been awesome watching now because I can really distinctly know everybody. Like I feel like now we're getting down to like a closer knit batch of everybody. And I feel like I know everybody's strengths and weaknesses. Like I feel now I'm really getting the cast and I'm so excited. Yeah, and they're also different too, you know? Yeah. Like they're very recognizable because they're also different. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I I liked a lot of the conversations in the workroom today. But, you know, well, Paquita wins the mini challenge, the reading challenge. She was super funny, super witty. Um, and then they just started the snatch game. It was so fast. R right? Like, they skipped all the, like, walk through the workroom, mm -hmm. the conversations. Who are you doing? Oh, I'm doing her, too. But you better change that character. Like, what? We didn't get any of that. No. Kind of didn't weird, get any right? of it, but and also the snatch game was a lot longer than normal too. Yeah, it's an hour twenty minutes of an episode. It's crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it was probably a decision that they made afterwards when they saw that the snatch game was actually amazing, mm -hmm. and they decided maybe to play more conversations in the workroom and more time for the snatch game rather than just, who are you doing? I'm doing this. Oh, that wig is awesome. That doesn't, you know, <laughs> it can be juicy sometimes, but sometimes it's just not. Yeah, unless unless RuPaul is there to tell you to second guess your choice and to do something completely different and then you get eliminated, then it's not worth yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, classic. It's a classic. Love it. Love it. Well, let's get into this snatch game. I was laughing so hard because I don't even know who Karina is, but- Now you know. <laughs> now I know. Literally, Poopy and Karina being the two players of the snatch game and Poopy <laughs> was as Karina and they literally- <laughs> this is the most chaotic but funniest thing I have seen in a while on um, Drag Race. So I I give Poopy props and Karina, Marta, fill us in. <laughs> Karina's a, like a singer in Spain from many years ago. She went to Eurovision and she's been like a staple on Spanish TV. We know her just like in pop culture. Uh, but it was Poopy's um snatch game actually as mm -hmm. you can see and she was the queen that performed the best actually in that snatch game even though killer queen won the challenge but her snatch game was amazing now you can see how amazing her snatch game is she doesn't even look like Karina very much but she has like her voice everything her down to yep. T looking at her slightly and copying everything that she's doing this decision was Genius. I loved it. Loved it. Boopy won the snatch game for me. This I one. also I love, mean. yeah, I also <laughs> love that, like, <laughs> Karina would be writing down her answer for her, like, her when she was supposed to answer a question, and then Poopy would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have written that. Like, it was just so <laughs> funny, like, just the banter between them. And then when they all sang at the end, I was like, this, this is great. <laughs> Um, so let's go ahead and get into these Snatch Game characters. I knew two, or three, I guess you would say, Snatch Game characters. I wish I knew more. I knew the first one. I knew the Macarena as Paca. Yes, Paca I, Lapidana. Yes, mm -hmm. I was very familiar with that. I was confused why the Macarena would do Paca. I mean, they looked pretty great. And yeah, go. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons, actually. Uh, in the reunion, her season, uh, she got asked, like, who she would have done in the snatch game. And she did a little Paca La Piraña, and it was, like, so good that people told her, like, oh, that's so good. And then in her TV show, Si Lo Digo, where she was reviewing Drag Race España, mm -hmm. um, she had Paca La Piraña, like, a guest 
and she was doing Paca la Piraña with her, and it was hilarious because <gasps> she does a very, very good impression. She does, but it was just Paca la Piraña when she just woke up or something. Like, there wasn't a lot of energy. There wasn't a lot mm-hmm. of jokes. Paca la Piraña is super funny. But her voice, the accent, everything oh, she that said was, there. was absolutely there. Yeah. You watch Veneno, right? Do you know her from Veneno yes. or from Drag Race? Yes. No, I know from yes. Veneno. Do you know that Paca La Piraña is actually the co-host for the tour in Spain? Yes. El Gran Hotel de las Reinas. You have Supreme as the host and Paca La Piraña as well. So they, Yeah, she would Paca- come in in her little like maid outfit sometimes, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. So Macarena has been touring with Paca La Piraña for months. It's like playing Michelle Michaz, basically. You know, mm-hmm. it's almost... It's like you've lived with her, you know, you've been touring with her for months. So she did a good job in the impersonation, but she wasn't able to make it funny. Yeah. And I yeah. thought she looks like her too. I know that they were making fun of her and saying from the, from the top down, she was ready for a Zoom call. But, <laughs> but I thought she looked fine. I thought she looked fine. <laughs> she was okay. I don't think this was like super, super, super bad, but there were a lot of very strong players in the Snatch game. And there was a lot of um, also facial reconstruction. That's the most facial reconstruction I've seen on the Snatch game in forever. Of wearing, <laughs> of wearing... <laughs> there are two. Prosthetics. Yes, yeah. prosthetics three are three. Yes, yes. <laughs> so let's get into Bestia's character. Bestia's character is from like a TV show in Spain. It's a fictional character and it's called okay. Isabel Las Hierbas. The TV show is Aquí no hay quien viva and it's a super huge, huge show in Spain. And it's this middle-aged woman like with a new age vibe that is obsessed with like natural medicine. And so she brings like a mandala and a lot of herbs. La Hierbas means like the lady with the herbs, mm-hmm. you say. So it's that character. She looked exactly like her. <laughs> she, like, the makeup was absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. But it's not a character that it's easy to make funny. Like, she opens her purse and she brings, like, tea out and, like, a pipe. And that's, like, it. Like, what what can you do with that character, right? Yeah, and I didn't get a lot of... From what I was picking up, I didn't get a lot of jokes or like anything that she was pushing as well. And anything that she said, it seemed like it was just rattlesnake sounds. Yeah, a little bit like she was okay. She does have a little problem with diction. Like sometimes Mm. you cannot, and she's been having this problem. She had it last week. But I think she, like, it's another, another one that she looks like her. She talks like her, but she wasn't able to make it funny enough. Yeah. You know? I also think that Ornella was cracking me up along with Vanya because Ornella and Vanya, they were basically like a package deal. And I don't think they knew that when they were walking on the set, but they became a package deal. They absolutely did. This was the gag. Like, they are so ballsy. Like, doing this, you have to be very, very brave to do this in Spain. I mean, like she even Ornella was talking about like calling her lawyers. And I think that's a good idea, probably. <laughs> but Ornella was playing our former king, El Rey Juan Carlos I. He's still alive, but he had to like flee the country. He's living like in Saudi Arabia now. Yeah, a lot oh of like, very bad scandals. Yes. Like that. Yeah. Uh, our the for, act the current king is his son obviously and our king the former king has been married for many years to the queen absolutely but he we know that he has had many mistresses and one of the mistresses that we know he has had is Barbara Fay. all of this is alleged okay allegedly 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 <laughs> So I don't know if they knew this beforehand, if they decided it in the house where they're all living together, or if it was just a coincidence, but they both look exactly like each other. Yes! Like they are amazing. And the energy between them was just amazing because they didn't have to say much. 
like they had a couple funny jokes, but uh-huh. it was just the energy and the physical comedy and how they reacted to everything that was going on. Ornella was really amazing because she had every single pun that you can imagine Mm -hmm. like the attitude of like the half the smile and being kind of naughty that the king has as well um but my favorite part is when she like makes a circle with her hands and does this like who am i who am i like (laughs) i'm a one euro coin (laughs) of course her coins has his half his face so i don't know was this understandable from the u.s without knowing who they were like you could get it right yeah i could get it and i thought it was hilarious i thought Vanya also to come from such a low earlier in the episode to then coming out on this high, I was I was very proud of her. And I was very happy that she got the praise too, because I do think she needed that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen people online saying, like, what would have been of Vanya's snatch game if Ornella wasn't there? Like the king wasn't there. Mm. And I have another question. What would have been what would have happened if any other person tried to do Barbara Rey? If Pitita tried to do Barbara Rey, for example, it, that wouldn't have worked. Like, yeah. you have to be lucky sometimes, but you also have to make things work. We have the case in the US when they played Beyonce and her daughter. That didn't work. Like, Ooh, tendons no. don't usually work. She was lucky and she did a good job, but Barbara Rey is not an over the top person, you know? Yeah. And she was doing all these things. Barbara Rey says that she has recordings of her meetings with the king. And, you know, the secret services have always been very interested. And all the tabloids have always been very interested. And, you know, it, it's it's allegedly uh, the king like, or the secret services, like, paid her off for those <gasps> recordings. That's why she's giving, like, the She gave the VHS the tape. <laughs> And the king was giving her money all the time. Like, there you are. That was, like, amazing. And then she said, yeah, they they broke into my, ho- my home and the tapes just disappeared while she's taking all the money. Like, yeah, I don't know what happened to the tapes. They just disappeared. It was so funny. I just loved it. It was so good. So besides being a mistress, who, who would, <laughs> what was Barbara known for? Barbara Rey was like a classic Spanish vedette. And she was a sex symbol, absolutely. Like in the 70s and the 80s when the women started like showing more skin in all the films. And she's been like a celebrity in general for several reasons. She's like an actress. She does like vedette cabaret style, actually. And she's known for that. She like, she was married after the king and then she like, had another relationship back with the king oh after that gosh. marriage like it's a whole story like we know the whole thing and actually one of the questions that to them asked was you know they always say the name of a person they mm-hmm. said Corina Larson says that blah 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 um that's another mistress of the king like it, it was very <laughs> coincidental they paid her off like millions of dollars of euros to this Corina, like millions. It was the hugest scandal that you can imagine. Wow. And yeah, it, 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 it is still married to this day to the queen. Like you guys don't have a monarchy. That's amazing. Like that makes a lot of sense, not having a monarchy, but you don't have all the drama that comes with having a monarchy. Like that's the only use they have right now. <laughs> We had a presidency <laughs> with some mistresses, but it wasn't this fun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You have to think like Stormy Daniels, but yep. with like European royalty, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, next up, we had Pink Shador as Lola Flores. I was mm-hmm. semi-familiar, but not fully familiar. Yeah. Lola Flores was a very famous folklorica, like these Spanish song singers. A flamenco singer, uh, also an actress. She died many years ago, actually, but she was an icon and has become an icon through especially all the drag queens and all the queer people that keep her memory alive all the time. Like 
you know, she was big when she was alive, but she's still big, even though she's not here anymore. And that's thanks to the, the queer arts mainly. So could you could you tell that she was doing like a very good job? Because if you don't know Lola, maybe you don't know that she was doing very good. No, I could tell she was doing a really good job. No, I was yeah. picking it up. Yeah, she was amazing. She had uh, like- Cigarette earrings. earrings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because Lola has a very famous video of an ad of that specific brand of cigarettes when cigarettes used to have ads on TV. Oh. Uh, yeah, and she pronounced it with a very like Spanish accent. So it was like she was doing all the little things of Lola Flores. And she was also a very specific Lola Flores from a very specific point in time where she did a lot of like interviews, like sit down interviews, very long ones. So we're very familiar to this one. She is, I don't know, she has her own voice and her own opinion and she had the character down. She didn't have to mm -hmm. study every single sentence, but she was in that character in the moment, you know? Yeah. Well, someone who was not in the character in the moment was, was Peppa Pink. Peppa Pink. What is that? Oh, poor thing. They didn't even explain who Peppa they Pink They didn't is. at all. Like, they did it. It's supposed to be like Peppa Pig. Of course, uh -huh. it's not say Peppa Pig because that's like registered and it has copyright or whatever. But she transformed into Peppa Pink. She was supposed to be Peppa Pig when she grows up and she goes into like, she's a visit now or something like that. And she is like doing sexual jokes and adult things all the time. Poor thing. This was painful. I love Paquita was... so much. It also felt like she didn't speak hardly at all. And when she did, it wasn't like great or wonderful. I did get the whistle joke. Was it a great whistle joke? No, because there's that one clip that went viral of Peppa Pig on the phone and asking Susie if she could whistle. I remember that to a T. That was but funny, yeah. Yeah, and that was the only thing that I technically really saw of her. Um, and then yeah, the they judges- didn't show much. Yeah, and then the judges basically were saying what? That she should have really hyped up the sexualization of jokes and stuff? I never understand what the judges say, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest, because it doesn't really make sense. Like, if they're saying, take it down a notch or be more sexual, I think they were saying, like, take it all the way. Like, if you're going to make, mm -hmm. like, a sexual joke, have it in, like, a context, have it go somewhere but they didn't really sh show as much. I don't know if that's good yeah. or bad because I don't know what they didn't show us, you know? I only know what I saw and it was painful, poor thing. Uh, poor thing. Well, Peppa Pig. Rest in pig. <laughs> Rest in pig, <laughs> yes. Roast and pig. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Clover bish. Yeah. Clover, to be honest, to be honest, I have to be honest, uh, I didn't know who this character was. You know, okay. I'm not, I'm not that smart. Um, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm informed now. Now I know. I've seen a lot of references. This is someone from reality TV. She was a contestant on like Big Brother season like 16 or something. Okay. Like something. Like I don't know that. I don't watch. Big Brother, but she's been in several other reality. She went to Big Brother with her daughter, who ended up winning. Oh wow! And yeah, so when you think like reality TV star, if I have to compare it to something that you're familiar in the U.S., maybe like someone from Jersey Shore. Okay. Someone that, that is like quite vulgar and says things that are completely inappropriate all the time. Mm -hmm. She's like absolutely crazy. And her daughter is actually not crazy whatsoever, but she has like a crazy mom. And all of the things that she was saying are exactly things that Mike Day says. Like she did a very good impersonation and she had the character down. It's not that she was doing too much. The mm -hmm. character is like that, mm -hmm. you know? She actually did a very, very good job and she was funny. The thing is that she wasn't like improvising too much. She was reciting the things that Maite says, and she was doing that brilliantly. But that's the only reason I can think why she wasn't on the top, because in any other season, this performance would have been a top performance. Yeah, and I was laughing the whole time at it, too. So the the jokes were were making their way to me. So I was mm -hmm. understanding her.
She looked like her too. Like She did. Cool. When you put this comparison next to each other, I'm like, okay, wow. And then the more comparisons that you are putting, I'm like going on to the next one. I'm like, okay, Petita, I could see it now. I could see it. Yeah, I, I can't. So that's good that you can't. I, I, mean, I can't. I mean, it. I can see it with the with the plastic surgery esqueness of it. I think that the double chin and stuff is a little like over the top. They, you, you know, and I couldn't figure out is this how is this how she actually spoke or was it was she having an issue because of her prosthetic? I don't think it's the prosthetics necessarily. It's a she's trying to do Sarah Montiel's voice. Okay, this is Sarah Montiel. She was a very classic actress and singer and she was actually in many movies from like old Hollywood like she was very well known in the US as well and she's been like a classic celebrity in Spain forever she has a very specific way of speaking I think Pitita every time she tries to do someone posh um, she uses basically the same accent it was kind of similar mm. to the accent from last week from the acting challenge it was kind mm -hmm. of similar and yeah, she, she, there are some good things and some bad things about this performance. I did not like the prosthetics because she's trying to be Sara Montiel right before she died when she has, oh. was a little bit bigger. For me, dressing like in a fat suit or with mm -hmm. these type of prosthetics doesn't make it funnier, doesn't mm -hmm. add a lot. Sarah Montiel was someone that was very, very glamorous and over the top. Her house was full with like pictures and little tchotchkes and little things everywhere. And I don't see that. She doesn't look the glamorous lady that Sarah Montiel was, actually. She did study a lot of interviews and you can say, see that the three interventions that she had were things that Sarah have said in her life so mm -hmm. we're all very familiar to those things like she brings out some eggs that she cooked to Marlon Brando that's a story that she always told you know but other than that it was just things that she had prepared and that she said it doesn't matter where or what the conversation was about she didn't sound like her necessarily I didn't like the look necessarily mm -hmm. for me this may be controversial this was a bottom performance. Like you have to remember that this is not an impersonation challenge. This is an mm -hmm. improv comedy challenge. And the improv aspect is the most important aspect in Snatch Game. And there was absolutely no improv here. Yeah, no improv there. Somebody who did do improv though <laughs> was Visa as Paulina Rubio. <laughs> she was so good, so good. Do you know all this tea with Paulina Rubio? Do you know who no, she is? I know who Paulina Rubio is because back in the early 2000s, there were Paul, Paulina Rubio's songs that were always being played. And then I know that she also was a judge of ours on our US version of the X Factor for like oh, one right, season. Right. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Yeah. So Paulina Rubio is this classic Mexican pop star. Lisa chose a Mexican celebrity, was a very good idea. The thing is that Paulina Rubio, right before the pandemic, when the pandemic started and the lockdown started, she started streaming from her home, like every artist was doing, like Instagram lives and let's stay safe at home and all these things that we used to do. And, and uh, allegedly, allegedly, Paulina Rubio was like under the influence of several <laughs> things uh -huh. in these, yeah, in these lives. And you can actually see in one of those videos her like doing this. You're only going to see it. No one's going to understand it. But she was like it, snorting uh. something in one of the videos. Yeah. So this is like the craze. It seems like that. She was probably just like smelling a new perfume. But um, yeah, this was very good because she bought the crazy Paulina Rubio she has like a super funny hashtag with her name because Paulina Rubio had got a hashtag wrong and it's just a funny story like it all made a lot of sense if you know the character mm -hmm. no I, I had never seen her lives I knew her from before and the music but so she started having fun on her Instagram lives kind of like Britney Spears has on her Instagram 
they just we love Brittany. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love, yeah, of course we love Brittany. Um uh, yeah, but I, I understood where she was going from. I thought it was great. And Visa has just been pulling out all of these references to Mexican culture and her heritage. It's she's nailing it all. She had this very particular way of speaking as Paulina Rubio that uses all of her mouth all the time <laughs> with the S's that she pronounced the S's like that. She was doing amazing. I, I, I'm I loving Visa so much. Like, I'm such a fan of Visa right now. She is, Love yes. It. And then I can't wait to talk about this other thing um, on the runway. Um, yeah. We'll get into that when we get back from this break. And so much more. back it's exposed to spania we just talked about the snatch game and now there were some topics that were happening in the workroom we saw earlier in the episode vanya had a little bit of you know her breakdown which we discussed and then we get into ornella really talking about her hiv status and isn't that cool that it was yeah. from last week's episode that mm -hmm. they didn't have time to have like a proper conversation about it with all the Visa things about her family, but they mm -hmm. still found time this episode to continue yep. that conversation. I think that there is such a stigma around HIV and AIDS. And so anytime that anybody can speak on it and the viewer at home can see, hey, you know what? This is still a normal person. They do now have, you know, an expected life expectancy that is around the same as what somebody without HIV would have. Like, I'm so glad that these conversations are being had because I know that when I was younger in the gay community, when I first came out, I was very scared and nervous about HIV. It was just a thing that was instilled in me about like from my parents and they were just be protect, like, you know, this is bad. You're going to end up dying of this. And then my mom used, used HIV kind of as like a, a clutch to try not to make me become gay become uh that's so terrible that's yeah terrible. so i had all of these preconceived notions of what i believed hiv was and i wouldn't look up anything because i just listened to what i was told for my whole life but then once i met somebody who did have hiv and i understood a little bit more about their journey and i asked them questions then i really started to understand that a lot of these preconceived notions that people have about hiv is totally wrong so i'm more than glad when we have moments like this on camera because they're so needed yeah and it wasn't just only explaining that mm -hmm. why she decided to go public and that she is undetectable so she is untransmittable she cannot trans it's not only the information it's also the conversation that happens afterwards yes. when bestia says oh my god you're so brave and ornella says no brave shouldn't be the word to describe this you wouldn't say a person that tells you that has diabetes that they're very brave i'm just like tearing down the stigma that's not being brave it's about like mm -hmm. changing your stigma and then visa came in with a different perspective which i thought was so rich and she said that you know there's also privilege there because from where i come from people do die from this my mm -hmm. friend died from this and they don't have access to medication or to information like you have here mm -hmm. and i thought there were so many layers to that conversation that it 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 transcended the traditional conversation that we have about hiv which usually stops at indetectable is untransmittable mm -hmm. you know i thought it was my favorite thing about the whole episode actually it shows that it's not the same everywhere in the world no it's not and we have to be aware of our privilege mm -hmm. in order to you know in order to make things better so super mm -hmm. i'm super happy for Nella. i'm super happy about how they decided to still put this in this episode i'm happy about all of that very needed conversations. This is what we need from a TV show that's supposed to be for the LGBT community, you know? And it didn't feel forced. And that's what I love. I just love that these conversations are kind of becoming, they, they've always in Espana been natural, but I'm glad that like after those first two episodes, things are becoming more natural now. And it just feels less produced, which is great. 
Literally, yes. After watching all the like all star things and all the season fifteen, like yeah, you can see the difference with the girls and the conversations and how they react. And I don't know. I just love Drag Race España because of that so, so much. Good. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get into our guest judge this week. Yeah, so this is La Terremota del Corcón. If you look her up. You're going to see a lot of definitions for her job position. Like she is a singer, a comedian, a vedette, a person that wears crazy looks. They use all the words possible not to say she's a drag queen. She is a drag queen. She's a cis woman. The first like cis woman that is a drag queen that is very famous in Spain. She defines herself as a cis, like a, a drag queen. She has always mm -hmm. been a travesti in Spain. And... You know, I think it's kind of funny that Los Javis have and are this episode having all these jokes about the fact that Clover bitch is cis mm. and they didn't say anything about La Terremoto being a cis woman that does drag. Mm. And actually, all of them are cis. It's not only Clover bitch that is cis, you know, there's no yeah. trans people there. They're all cis. I was like a little bit angry at that, but <laughs> but La Terremoto is amazing. She's actually a very, very, very funny drag queen that does like covers and parodies of famous songs. She was started being known for this cover of like Hang Up by Madonna. She made it so funny. She's clever and she's so smart and mm -hmm. she knows her stuff. She's kind of an intellectual too in some way, you know? We love I her. loved everything she was bringing. I was like, keep bringing me more of this outfit, everything. I was like, Ooh. <laughs> and then I feel like the Supreme dressed up just because she was dressed up. Like, so this was all extra. I was, I was eating it up. It looked like they were competing against each other. Like, yes. they were like, <laughs> like in a beauty pageant, one person has one thing a little <laughs> bit more. It's like the next one needs to do something more. I was like, yes. <laughs> They look like a killer queen competition. Like more is more. Like it's a <laughs> not a killer queen <laughs> It's killer queen and Ariel Rack. That's who it is. <laughs> so let's get into these looks. Now, the category, Arriba La Pluma. Oh, your Spanish is improving so much. Oh my God. I'm going to have to charge you. <laughs> <laughs> Do a lingo. Do you, remember, <laughs> do you remember what I explained about La Pluma, about feathers? Yes, I do. So seeing this was literally like a full circle moment. And I was like, I know everything now because of Marta. And I feel so much more special. <laughs> so in case anyone missed, uh, the feather is absolutely, of course, the literal feather from the birds. But it actually is a word that we use in Spain to express like the flamboyancy, the, the feminine character of gay men and being proud mm -hmm. of your feather uh, means that you're very proud of not being like a mask man, you know? Mm -hmm. Cloverbish comes out in a long black latex, I guess, dress with feathers and black feathers at the bottom covered with black and more of like a nude colored feather at the top that looks kind of like a boa. Um, I thought the look was good. I didn't think it was anything crazy. Yeah, me too. She looked good. Um, she was supposed to be referencing the black swan because she is a trained mm. dancer. So this is from her time. But uh, you know something funny? I was watching this, of course, like with my daughter and my drag mom and like a lot of friends. And my daughter said that she looked you know, when in the old times, they used to, like, tar and feather people, like, pour tar yes. over them and then feathers? It looks like that, right? I thought it was, like, a drag glam version of that. And it's not. It's just us inventing references. But when she said that, I was like, wow. It does look like it. <laughs> I thought it was genius, you know? <laughs> but it's not. Yes. It's just a black swan. <laughs> Next up, we had Pink Shadora. Um, this look, I will say, I know the judges were not feeling it too much, and I wasn't feeling it too much either. It was like a short dress that was covered in ostrich feathers at the top and then feathers at the bottom. M my thing is that this looks very similar to a dress that Lady Boom Boom wore in Canada. Oh. 
So that's, and Lady Boo Boom's dress was a little bit more amplified. And like the judges said, when it was comparable across the board to everybody else's looks, it wasn't the standout for me. No, it wasn't. But I think what this look was a success, not because of the dress itself, it was because mm -hmm. she was able to make it camp mm -hmm. in some specific parts. Like um, in Spanish, we don't have the goose that led the golden eggs. In Spanish, it's the chicken, like the hen that laid the golden eggs. So this is, she is that oh. hen. That's why she goes, yeah, she goes to that side of the runway and she lays a golden egg. The boots look like the, you know, the camp chicken feet and even the red hair as like the rooster thing. How do you call the rooster mohawk? The rooster, <laughs> the, um, it's rooster <laughs> head thing. Thing. <laughs> oh, it's their comb. The comb. So yeah, the hair is supposed to be the comb. I think the dress itself is okay, but it's nothing amazing. But she knows exactly where to put the little pieces of camp here and there. Yeah. And now that you say that, I see the comb, the hair. It's a little <laughs> right? up. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Next up, we had the Macarena, who came out in a full headdress of peacock feathers. I love the peacock feathers. Um, I do wish that there were more on her body at the lower part, but this headdress was spectacular. And I will say, I don't know why the guest judge, Tere. She made a comment about how like peacock feathers are unlucky and you shouldn't be like surrounding yourself with too many of them. It to yeah. me it came off very rude. I don't know if that was just me, but the way she said it, I was like, ooh, ow. It wasn't rude. And by the way, she was right. But <laughs> is it like true? Old, it's like an old school drag queen thing. It's like dressing in yellow for some people is mm. bad luck. It's the same type of thing. It comes from a very old story of a war in Mongolia or something like that. I just read about it. But, you know, it's the things that the old drag queens say. And yeah. here in Spain, you have to share that type of knowledge. I sent you a reference photo for this mm -hmm. look. She's supposed, like, this is very recognizable for us. We have a Spanish singer, another folklorica called Maria Jimenez. Okay. that wore an outfit exactly like that. And she wore it a thousand million times, obviously, because that is very expensive. So mm -hmm. we, and, and she came out dancing as Maria Jimenez. Maria Jimenez is like a singer that like would drink and smoke. And she has this boss ass bitch energy all of the time. So it was like a kind of like super cool reference as well. You know, mm -hmm. it's not only the headpiece, it's the reference as well. She's bringing... Maria Jimenez to the runway. So are we saying that if the Macarena had not worn this, she may have still been in? She would have been naked. <laughs> <laughs> True. So maybe, so maybe. <laughs> but it looks like her look stopped at the waist. I know that she yes. lost a lot of weight and wanted to show her body and she wasn't wearing any padding. And now that she's transitioning, it was like a powerful moment for her. But, you know, it didn't look like completely finished in the bottom. Yeah. Like she ran out of money just under the titty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, we were going to make this last part of it for you, but <laughs> nope, it was too expensive. <laughs> we have a totally different interpretation from Paquita coming out looking like, I don't know what animal she looks like, but I will say I love this look. It looked very punk goth emo. I Black feathers, high boot, and then the hair, the mohawk hair, like, come on. I know. It's just, she's like so disturbingly beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's always, like, a disturbing quality sometimes. And it's very difficult in Drag Race to see an actual dark goth aesthetic. Like, they mm -hmm. always try, but they they never get it right. This is what people want to do when they're trying to portray, like, a dark goth aesthetic. And she's like a dark vedette, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like a Berlin goth suburban 
goddess. I don't know what she looks like, but this is very much Paquita's aesthetic in the real world. Mm. Like very recognizable Paquita. I was I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be in the alleyway with her at night. I would be scared. <laughs> I, would be like, I no. do want to be. I do want to be in an alleyway with her at night. <laughs> I wouldn't be scared. <laughs> Maybe she would be scared. <laughs> <laughs> she looks amazing. She's just. She looks uh, amazing. I love this look. Um, next up, we had Petito who came in with a humongous light blue baby blue feather attached to her and it was supposed to be like the quill and a pen i had one issue with this i wish that the pen would have been erect that was a floppy pen and i was like <laughs> and i don't know why it bugged me so much but when she was like picking it up i was like it's very phallic and it's very um <laughs> very penisy and i was like i don't i i wish it was a little bit more um hard <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult sometimes to get it as hard as you want it right yeah sometimes right <laughs> and then the other thing that i had issue with is that when she turned around i really wish that she would have been like in the feathers or there would have been something on her back because it did mm -hmm. just seem like she was just you know, wearing just the front piece. But I thought it was a very beautiful look and that had to have been so expensive. Yeah, very expensive. I have different issues with this. Well, yes. like, I think that in every se season, we've had a similar look to this. Like in season one, we had like Carmen's snake look for Veneno Runway. Yes. And in season two, we had Judigi's muscle look that she only yes. had like a big muscle clam. Um, this is like a similar interpretation. Um, I have two problems like the bodysuit and the legs didn't fit 100% awesome mm. and it stopped at the ankle and it was because it's the only thing from the body that you're seeing it draws a lot of attention uh, the feet look very funny if you zoom into that but it, that's okay I, I have no problem with that I think it was super funny that she said that she took this look to a less literal place and she brings the most literal most literal interpretation of the runway theme <laughs> that you can ever imagine and she's like yeah i don't like being literal this is not literal whatsoever and i'm like girl it's very <laughs> literal but it's cool i mean she looks like this is very expensive she looks very nice yeah, but it's got that little limp weenie pen. Next up, we have Bestia, and Bestia comes out, and this is the perfect, perfect definition of what you were saying. Um, what was it, two weeks ago about feathers, right? Yeah, it comes out of you, even if you don't want to, right? Yeah. It's coming out of every single crevice. She decided to have them red, so it, it's like the blood. It's your blood mm -hmm. is your feather, your effeminacy. And this like super gay, super rich fabric is like supposed to be an armor. And through that armor everywhere, there's like feathers coming out. Even if you try to stop them, they're just like coming out of everywhere. I loved it. You like it? I yeah. I loved it. I did. I, I will say that it's a very artistic interpretation of it but i i do love it i i think that she did a really good job and also just this that fabric i want a suit made out of it maybe the supreme could use that yeah i think this is like a traditional fabric from spain from like regional costumes like from las falleras and from valencia i think I, it looks like it at least I don't okay think well like marta can you go buy me some fabric Sure, baby. I'll do like 600 I'll... miles right now. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of this look? Uh, I, I, it wasn't my favorite. I love mm -hmm. that they took the time to explain it mm -hmm. because they don't do that in every franchise. And once I understood what it was supposed to be, I liked it a lot more. But yeah. I don't think it's the most. I want to see... It, like it, it seems a little too random the feathers I, I don't know I like the concept I like how she looks mm -hmm. but it wasn't my favorite look from Bestia yeah because Bestia has had some pretty impressive looks yeah well next up the 
most amazing artistic interpretation of this was Ornella Gongora. I'll tell you, I didn't know what to think about this when she walked out and was just covered in feathers. And I mean, covered. So many different colors the face uh, mask that she had on, everything was just, it literally was like art to me. Yeah, she's a very artsy person and she took it to a, an artsy part of, of the history of Spain. She's referencing an artist she has worked with uh, called San San Anasnas and the usual, I said your references of this too. Mm -hmm. What he usually did is like stick tons of like, flowers or feathers or just stuff onto his face and that was his look so this is recognizable if you know who that person is but that is not a famous person we're talking about underground reformative artists mm -hmm. that are well known in like a very artsy conceptual side of the world so she comes from this underground artsy world and I love that she's doing this it's not a drag racy look. This mm -hmm. is what she wanted to do for this runway, you know? And I loved it. Me too. So good. And the reference photos that you sent too, it, that is such a cool thing to do, like the face mask type. Oh. And somehow she looked amazing. She said that she was trying to do this mythological animal that's supposed to be the face of a woman and the body of an owl, but she inverted it. So it's the face of an owl and the body of like a woman of a bibet. It's a lot more like metaphorical, mythical. Mm -hmm. I I love this for her. I love when she gets all artsy and less of a, like a lady. So good, Ornella, coming at <sighs> it. And next up we had Vanya. Oh, Vanya, this was an episode for you. Literally, this look was incredible i mean it was so showgirl so feathers so that headdress oh my goodness this is just out of this world out of this world this comes from i think she borrowed this dress and it's from a real one of the biggest most important cabarets in the world which is lido in paris and this is an original costume from that super amazing, very well-known cabaret. And this is absolutely everything I love from Maria on steroids. This is everything. So old school, so classy, so extravagant, so over the top. It is mm -hmm. completely the definition of the runway, not only in the literal way, but also like in the pride of like the mm -hmm. people that have, been here before us you know uh it was stunning i would wear this in a heartbeat marta you wanna you wanna help zip me up <laughs> <laughs> just to go to costco with this yeah we're yeah that's where we're going <laughs> marta you know what i'll wear this look you can wear ornella's look and we're gonna go into costco just like that <laughs> <laughs> security security <laughs> They'd be like yeah. what is going on <laughs> <laughs> and last up, we had Visa. This was my favorite look of the night. This is amazing, right? So good. So good. She took the reference from, uh, what is it, Day of the Dead? Yeah, Katrina's. The Katrina's like a traditional character with the face of the skull, and they're usually dressed with like super luxurious oh. gowns and Mexican hats. Yeah. That yeah! hat, <laughs> so gorgeous, so big. I, oh my gosh, this interpretation, Visa, you gave it to me. I loved it. Do you want to know a secret? Yeah. She made that hat there the two nights before this runway. She spent two nights with no sleep making this hat. Well, it paid off. It paid off. Maria Edilia helped, a lot, helped her a lot. So, but she didn't sleep at all for two nights because she wasn't able to have this put together before she left for Drag Race. Well, she did a great job. I would have never have known that. No, literally. Like the, the interior of the hat as well, like the hat on the inside with all the little details. Yes. And on top, it's actually huge. It's not only very wide, but it's super tall as well. 
that this look is just amazing. She looks like a million bucks. This was one probably one of my favorites of the night as well, but it, there were so many good looks. This was my top, I will say, but every single look, I really enjoyed every look. This was a runway that there were not too many issues that I ever had. I was, they killed yeah. it. Did you get the conversations on in the Untucked? Because um, they said uh, that Pinchadora had like a double face, like she was two-faced. And she said, like, me? Like, am I Pitita or something? And she involved Pitita. Well, fast forward, Pitita is in the Untucked with Cloverfish. And she starts tearing down, reading all of these looks for filth. She starts saying that Visa looks super like too much and super like crafty arts and crafts and that she like she had she was reading the girls her and Pintadora and immediately they come in and she's like oh so beautiful the judges must have loved it you look so amazing <laughs> did you get that I'm, yes. lo I'm yes. loving loving the two-faced Pitita <laughs> two-faced Pitita is my favorite person. Like, she is so openly, like, me being two-faced. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm so <laughs> open about everything. <laughs> and then she's backstabbing all of them. And that's why Marta will gladly be with her in an alleyway where I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Titita is just the funniest thing right now for me. <laughs> well, let's take a break. We'll be right back to chat about these winner and our eliminated queen. We're back. Miss Marta Mama and I, Joseph Shepard. We just went over the runway looks. They were all feathered out and beautiful. And now we have our maxi challenge winner, which is Pink Chidora. Do you agree with that, Marta? Well, I think this was an episode for a double win for Nela and Vanya. They, mm. it, it made a lot more sense. I think Pichadora did do an amazing job, but their, her yeah. look wasn't as spectacular. And I think it was with the edit and with the conversations and with everything, it should have been Ornella and Vanya's mm, I, week. I second that, second that. Yeah. But well, like she, she shared her prize. Like she said, yes. oh, Ornella did amazing, so I'm going to share my prize with Ornella. Who does that? Yeah, because the other time Pinchadora won, everyone thought Clover was going to win. So she mm -hmm. won unexpectedly, and she didn't think that she deserved it. I don't know why, but, you know, so now she wins again without expecting it. But I think she did a good job. She just shared it good enough. Like, no one does that anywhere. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, so then we had our bottom two, Paquita and the Macarena. Oh. I know. They're my friends. <laughs> That's what I kept thinking the whole time. I was like, Marta's <laughs> probably bawling her eyes out that her two babies are on TV performing against each other. Bawling completely. And I was so proud of both of them. I think, like, do you know that Macarena in season one went home with a Monica Naranjo song? And yes. now in this she had another Monica Naranjo song. It's crazy, like all these curses, like we keep talking about, right? And what do you think about the lip sync? Did you like the lip sync? I did not. I did not like the lip sync. I feel like I was sensing Macarena knew that she was going to go home. Yeah. And so I saw it in her face for that first half of it. But then once one of the judges ended up singing like, come on, give it to me or whatever they said. And then she started pushing it a little bit more. I just wish that that fight would have been there just a little bit longer. I know that that's the most frustrating thing to get into the bottom and then you you feel defeated. And I can't tell you what I would do if I was in the bottom because it may be the same thing that the Macarena did, but I really wish that there would have been that spark just for that little first half. Yeah. And I do think that it was more about the connection between these two people that have known each other for many mm -hmm. years and they love each other very much. And it was about that moment between the two of them. It was more about that than someone is getting eliminated, you know? So I love the vibe. It Maybe it was lacking a little bit of energy in some moments. Maybe it could have been a lot bigger. 
but but it was cute i think it was cute i was very sad <laughs> i could tell i was like oh no and then like I, the macarena like just seeing i will say the macarena seemed a lot happier at the end of this episode as in like i showed what i could show i'm happy with my package i'm happy with where i am and she left out and i i felt very very good in how she felt like I saw that in her eyes and it just seemed like that there was a confidence that she didn't have last season I mean first season yeah well we only saw her for like 40 minutes true <laughs> but what 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 do you think about her run in this season like what what have you discovered about Macarena that you didn't know what do you think she accomplished I think the Macarena can act I didn't know that she could act when she was in the acting challenge I was loving and eating that up I loved her runways I think that her as an individual causing drama under people's skin, making people like just think, oh, well, she shut up. I'm like, well, it wasn't that big of a deal, but okay. But she <laughs> she did what needed to be done. And I think that she really did um, capitalize on her name. Yeah. And after last week's episode, like both of them were in the top last mm -hmm. week, you know, after last week episode she did so amazing her look was like such a full circle moment i think she showed what she wanted to show in season one and more and a bit yeah. you know so i'm yeah. definitely proud of her i love her very much mm. Mm. <laughs> well say goodbye to the macarena and marta and i are going to be saying goodbye to you all until next week yeah make sure to subscribe to our show you can rate us and review us in your podcast app. So go over there and leave us like a cute review. Yeah. And be sure to send us some email at draggedoutpod at gmail.com. And we may read it on the show next week. Yeah. And remember to follow us at La Marta Mama and at Joseph Shepard on all the socials. So thanks so much for listening. And we'll be back for you all next week with a new episode. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.